All right, folks, uh, welcome. It's our first online AMP recording lecture. This is a different experience for all of us here. Well, not for me, I've done this before, but uh, in this particular circumstance, we are never done it in March, that's for sure. Uh, well, I hope everyone's doing all right, hanging in there, um, you know, getting used to the, the new way of things. Hopefully, chaos not fully descended. I'm recording this on Friday. Uh, before the Monday before classes resume, so who knows what will happen in the next three days. I uh, never quite know. I'm hoping nothing crazy. Uh, but yeah, so we're going to pick this up and get it rolling the rest of the way. Hope people actually listen to these. Uh, spent time making them. Uh, but at the very least, I guess read the notes. If you do listen to this, this is where probably the bonus question stuff will come from. So, there's still reason to tune in. Uh, to that sort of stuff, uh, but yeah, so it should be a good time. You no, know, I'm gonna try to make these not too long because that's the goal, but I mean, you never quite know what's gonna happen in reality. Uh, but yeah, my goal is for these to be all right. So, what's the deal with this thing? Well, uh, it's heavily involved in the immune system. So, we've already talked about the immune system, we're gonna test on the immune system. Thank goodness for that. Um, but this is associated with that, so let's play it another role. We talked about lymph a little bit, uh, a little bit. <laughs> Talk about lymph a little bit, a little bit, uh, with the immune system, but, you know, we're going to go further into it now. Alright, so this whole system, okay, it was all about returning fluids that have been leaked from blood vessels. So back we talked about the blood vessels, right? We talked about all that fluid uh, getting pushed out, right? You had those pressures. And then we, I mentioned casually, oh yeah, that excess fluid is just then pumped back into the system, via the lymphatic system, right? That's why that one pressure was always low. Well, that's what happens here. It returns that fluid from those areas to the bloodstream. Uh, and there's a few parts to it. Uh, the first of which is the actual vessels themselves, called lymphatics. The lymph, which is the fluid inside the vessels. And then the lymph nodes, which process and clean up the lymph. You know, take care of anything that just happens to have gotten in there and see what needs to be done. Uh, and there's a variety of organs and tissues involved with this, of course. Main job is to help out in the immune system. So it houses some cells that are important for those functions, and there's many structures involved. This is one of those weird ones where like there's a grab bag of structures kind of involved in one way or another. Uh, so if the spleen comes in, finally talking about that thing again, uh, thymus, tonsils, all those sorts of things. Uh, so uh, moving on, I'll let you close those. I mean. Uh, and so we have the lymphatic system. So again, returning that fluid back to blood. Lymphatic vessels are the main ones that transport lymph. And so they drain it back. And this is pretty elaborate uh, because if you've seen the picture, like you can see, it's pretty crazy. There's a wide variety of different locations because blood capillaries are found in all those locations. So you need to find a way to get that fluid back to the heart and back into circulation so it's not wasted. And so that's what it does. And it carries about three liters of fluid a day, which is pretty impressive. Uh, like, take a look at a two liter. You know, you can buy, like, drinks in and then double that. Or, not double it. Um, increase it by half. And then it gives you three liters. That's a lot of fluid moving around inside the body. Uh, but once you have that fluid, that interstitial fluid, actually inside the lymphatic vessel, that's when you get to self lymph. So it's not lymph for just hanging out outside the blood capillaries. It has to go inside the lymphatics first. Then you can call it lymph. But not, not before. Not after. And so the main advantage of this is it's a one-way system, and it goes and returns blood, uh, returns that fluid back to the bloodstream. But it's kind of weird, though, that it is a one-way system. Because, like, we think about blood, it's like, oh, you know, it's a two-way system, you know, all this, all that, you know, it's all, all great and dandy. Uh, but in reality, like, it's kind of unusual that this one is actually that way, that it's this one-way system. Um, so, yeah. But with this, uh, there's a few structures. So there's capillaries that actually pick it up, and then those will slowly pull into larger and larger vessels. Which is kind of like how blood works, too, where you have, you know, capillaries, and then that lead into venules that lead into, you know, veins, and bigger and bigger veins as you go on down. So pretty common. It's a similar idea, just a one-way system. And it just stops around the heart, and then boom, it's done. Uh, so it carries a bunch of stuff back with it. So excess fluid, uh, any sort of leaked proteins that have, that have cut left, and bring those back, and any sort of fat, too. It's bringing all that stuff back in there. Uh, so these lymphatic capillaries, 
Uh, these are these little uh, vessels, so they're called blind because they only have like one end to them. And they exist between these different cells in the blood capillaries. They're not found in a few spots because uh, it's just, you know, they don't, they're not needed for some reason or another or they just have other systems in place to drain them. Uh, but one thing that's different is they are more perme permeable compared to blood capillaries. So they're able to take in more material than blood capillaries are. And that kind of makes sense because uh, I mean, their main job is to drain things. You want to be a little more susceptible. And you want to be able to take in things like proteins a little easier. Meanwhile, with blood, you don't necessarily want to lose those. You want to keep those in. Uh, so, you know, bring it in there. So, blind. Uh, the animal on the bottom right is a naked mole rat. And those can sometimes be blind. So, it's kind of weird. They kind of, well, not really as much, but they really just dig tunnels and things, so much like uh, the, the lymph vessels. You know, they dig these random, elaborate tunnels all over the place. You know, lymphatics, naked mole rats, kind of the same thing. Uh, naked mole rats, interestingly enough, uh, have some adaptations to where they don't get cancer. They have ways to prevent that from happening. So, uh, immune system, speaking of, well, boom, that's a big one to get. Look at that ugly baby in the middle for them. Like, man, that thing is not a looker. Um, not... Not a cute baby. All right. With these lymphatic vessels, so since they're more permeable, they can take up larger things that happen to get lost inside the bloodstream. Uh, so they can take in cell debris. They can take in pathogens, cancerous cells. That's not great, right? That's bad. Uh, but they also take in protein, so some good and some bad. You can take down cell debris to reuse, break it down further, proteins to be reused back in the body. However, pathogens and cancer can take advantage of the system and then use it to travel across the body and spread. That's when you get yourself an issue because uh, you don't want that to happen. And so here's a rough diagram talking about uh, the spread of lymph, these vessels, how they go through. So uh, we have, you can see the capillaries that exist in the blood capillaries. And then they would drain, pick up all that fluid, and then tons of capillary, right? See all that area down there? Oh, they are down there, and they slowly converge into larger and larger vessels. And then those move on up in complexity from collecting the lymphatic vessels to nodes to trunks to ducts. And you'll look at some of these a little more in the lab, uh, some pictures in the book. I don't know how many good diagrams for it other than what they have there, really. Um, but so, but there's permeability like, where does it come from? Like, why are they so permeable? What, what gives them this advantage? What adaptations do they have? And so it turns out they have many valves, not many vans, many valves. And so they overlap, some of these cells overlap, and they form kind of those little openings. And so the structure of that allows them to respond to the uh, extracellular fluid. So as that fluid increases due to blood brushing through the capillary beds and pushing blood up, blood fluid out, not directly blood because blood stays in, but the fluid out increases the volume in that space, which causes those mini valves to open up and then push more stuff in there. So they open up with the increased amount of fluid. So the more fluid you have, the more other stuff can get pushed in. However, if you have a decrease in your ECF, so that fluid around there, it causes less pressure to open up those valves so that they close a little more, so less things pass. So it really is, you know, just a case-dependent situation. But that's one of the adaptations they have. Mini valves. You know what they do. They also have lacteals. Lacteals are a cool thing. Uh, we're going to mention these again with the digestive system. So in lab, for sure, we have some models that you'll look at that show those. Even if it's online, I still get pictures of the models. So don't worry. You have, you'll still get to see those models that we have. I didn't want anybody to go with the rest of the semester without seeing the models. That'd be devastating. Uh, all for the people. All for you. Um, but these are special uh, capillaries, and these are actually found in the intestines. So what they do, it's a special layer in the intestines called the mucosa. And so they actually help absorb fat and deliver this um, back into the bloodstream. Or deliver this to the bloodstream so it can be distributed throughout the body. Uh, and so this fatty lymph is called chyle, C-H-Y-L-E. Uh, and there's actually some like, cool little structures involved with that. We're not going to talk about it too much, but uh, it's like um, colicron, something like that. So, whatever, color microns, we're good. Uh, but anyway, so here's some of that. So you can see the mini valves and so that little flap. So, I mean, it, it makes sense, right? If you have a ton of liquid out there, it's going to push that flap in and just carry all that crap with it. Meanwhile, if there's not a lot of fluid, there's not a lot of pressure to push it down. So I was like, eh, leave it alone. Looks like a weird, I don't know. I don't know what's going on there. Looks like a finger with a fingernail, but it's green. I just remembered that. 
Uh, so, as these vessels get bare from the capillaries, uh, they can become collecting lymphatic vessels. And so, these are collectively, you have uh, these vessels, you have trunks, then you have ducts. Uh, now, in terms of their overall tissue structure that they have, their walls, it's actually pretty similar to veins. Uh, and so, they're more like veins than arteries, really. Uh, the main one of the major exceptions is they actually have thinner walls, which is pretty crazy because the whole vein thing. Uh, they have more internal valves to prevent backflow of lymph to keep it going in one direction. And they have more areas of anastomoses to where they actually allows them to, to prevent clogs so the lymphatic vessel doesn't get clogged as much. So even more so than the veins, which is pretty impressive. Um, I mean, we thought veins was the top dog, but apparently not. Uh, and so these collecting vessels, uh, they travel along with the veins, um, but the deep ones travel with arteries. So that's one thing to keep up with the vessels is lymphatic. It travels with both. It just depends. So if you have a, a more shallow or external uh, lymphatic vessel, it's going on with the veins. If it's deeper, it's going with the arteries. Uh, and then so with these trunks, uh, these are big ones formed by many of those collecting vessels coming together. So these are larger drainage areas uh, coming in. So I think this oak tree is a good example of that, this live oak. If you have those many big branches coming in collectively and just dumping into that one big point, well, that's a, that's a trunk, a tree trunk, lymphatic trunk, kind of the same thing. Uh, and they're named for kind of where they drain from. So you have a bunch of different types. You have the lumbar region, the bronchomediastinal, which does the lung and heart region. Lumbar, you know, does the lumbar region. <clears throat> the subclavian does up near the arms, uh, the shoulders, the jugular trunks is the neck, uh, and then intestinal would be, you know, obviously down low. Uh, and then so with lymph, it's carried into, once they've, from the trunks, they'll go dump into two different types of ducts. And you have two options, uh, two types of ducts you can have. You can have a silly duck or a not silly duck. Just kidding. Uh, you can have the right lymphatic duct, which drains the right upper arm and right side of the head, or you can have the thoracic duct, which drains the rest of the body. So if the lymph is coming from the right upper arm, or like they know the right shoulder or something, well, that's going to be draining into, uh, into the back of the blood via the right lymphatic duct. However, if it's coming from like your left foot, then it'll be coming from the thoracic duct down that pathway. Uh, so two different ways to kind of get back in there. Uh, and so these will empty uh, the lymph back into the vein circulation, uh, between those different veins, so you can see where that's uh, jumping in at. So it dumps it back in at the respective locations, and then those veins will soon after dump right back into the heart. So it's just bringing things back. Uh, one of my favorite ducks of all time is Daffy Duck. I love me some Daffy Duck. He's also my favorite Looney Tunes characters. I don't know, Bugs was cool. I liked Bugs, but I don't know, something about Daffy. I think it's sassiness. I spoke to me. Uh, I don't know, it was just funny. I always wanted a Daffy Duck Space Jam doll. I never got one. It was like a vending machine back when Space Jam first came out and had all the characters in the outfits. I always wanted one, never got it. Uh, my cousin, of course, got the Bugs Bunny one. Because, you know, it's just how it worked. I probably spent like 10 bucks trying to get that thing out of there. Because I don't know, I couldn't find it in stores anywhere. Uh, other than a small town in Mississippi at the time, there wasn't a whole lot of options uh, for things. It was a different time. Anyway. Here's a picture showing some things. You have to know some things off of this for lab. But yeah, it's just good to look at it so you can visualize how these things travel. Uh, and here's another one that shows the breakdown of the area. So the thoracic duct, uh, where that drains, the right lymphatic duct, where that drains. Uh, this is sort of chill eye. We'll talk about that. So all these different structures. Uh, you'll definitely have to know this figure for lab. And point structures. Uh, so to recap, you know, let's think about some stuff. What does lymph do? All right, let's go back, and this is something, you know, keep doing, you know, as we go forward here. You know, I know it's kind of, you know, different now, uh, but we can still think about, like, what are we talking about? So keep refreshing throughout. So take moments, take pauses, and, and focus on what we talked about uh, that week this in this lecture. And so lymph functions, right? So we have, it's involved with the immune system, right? And it helps restore blood volume. Uh, we haven't talked about the immune system functions quite yet, uh, not too much in depth, but the blood cell we have, right? It returns it back at those uh, the subclavian jugular vein sections. Uh, permeability structure, that's our next one, and remember that. If you think about what helps uh, parents carry you know, lots of junk along the locations, it can have a pretty nice door of permeability. 
uh, it allows all that crap to get in there. It's a minivan, all right? So it kind of makes sense. Mini valves, mini vans. And that helps with permeability. Uh, allows more things to come through. Uh, the flow. What kind of flow does the lymph have? Well, the lymph goes one direction, right? It goes from capillaries to drain it back to the vessels near the heart. So one way. It doesn't go backwards. It just goes that one way. Lymph. What is lymph? This is a basic one, but still it's pretty easy to get slipped up on because it's like, oh, it's just the fluid, but like where? The key thing is it's fluid and the lymphatic vessels. If it's just that fluid outside of the lymphatic vessels where it's about to collect it outside the blood vessels, the blood capillaries, it's not quite lymph yet. So it's inside lymph fluid inside the lymphatic vessels. Key, key thing. Uh, and then lastly, what are lacteals? Well, remember lacteals? They're that crazy thing found inside the intestines and they help absorb uh, fat uh, from meals and can return that to the or bring that to the blood so it can be reused by the body. So, big little feature. Not bad. It's from the intestines, absorb fat. Now, let's talk a little bit about my lymphatic system. So, when it transports stuff out, this is a low pressure system, right? And if, as we learned back with blood vessels, with veins, if you're going to have low pressure, you got to have a way to get that crap back somehow, you know, some way, somehow, right? It's got to get back at some point uh, and bring it back. So, uh, lymph has actual similar mechanisms as veins do. So if you think about it, like, what are some things that veins did? Like, how did that bring things back? It's kind of the same thing here. Uh, so if we look ahead, um, the skeletal muscle, right? Moving of muscles helps, you know, constrict and push blood through the veins. Same deal with lymphs. Also, when you breathe, change inside that cavity, it's going to affect that. It's going to cause more lymph to return. It's got valves, right? To bring it back, there's just more in veins. But you can see in the diagram on the bottom right, there's valves there that allow for one-way flow for any sort of uh, backflow of lymph. Uh, arteries, when the arteries move, remember they expand when they pulse, like that helps drive and push fluid along. And then you also have smooth muscle contractions inside the walls that the thing itself can actually use, be used to help push it along. So lots of stuff. And then just like with veins, the more active you are, the more blood gets returned to your heart. Well, same deal with lymph. The more active you are, it increases that flow back. Uh, and so one of the things to keep up with is like, okay, well, you're moving these things around, but if you mobilize an area, it keeps that stuff there to help heal it. Um, it keeps it there. You know, if you moved around, it would cause more movement of the lymph and more absorption of it, more blood in all that area. So you would actually drain some of those helpful inflammatory materials you need to heal. Uh, so if that's why immobilization can be helpful. So, you know, a little, little fun tip for you. Learning things every day. All right, so with the lymphatic system, you have immune cells. So lymphoid cells have immune system cells inside of lymphatic tissue. Uh, and so there's some cells there that actually help out with this whole process. Uh, so let's look. So we have, excuse me, I'm sorry. We have immune system cells. And so these are the lymphocytes. And so we have T cells and B cells. We've talked about these, right? This isn't totally new. These are the adaptive immune system cells. So they will become uh, T or B cells, cell lymphocytes. And so we know what they do, uh, the role they play, the crucial role they play in the immune system. God, my eyes burning. I don't know why. Oh my God, I think I got something in my eye. Oh man, that hurts. I have the battle through. Fight it. Oh my God. Uh, so uh, then we have uh, other things found in there are macrophages and dendritic cells, and those help play, you know, an important immune response. Remember, dendritic cells are important as antigen-presenting cells in the immune system, and then macrophages are important for getting rid of a bunch of stuff that is there that doesn't need to be there, so eliminating some of that nonsense. Uh, so it's good. My eye is still, like, on fire. I don't know what happened. Um, and so uh, I ate some chips, so I might have some barbecue or some residual on there. That has got in my eye, so it's okay. If I go blind, well, we know what happened. Uh, main functions of lymphatic tissue. So, of lymphoid tissue, what's the main job of this thing? Well, of this is to hold those lymphocytes and allow places them to grow and mature and do what they need to do once they're activated. And all of also allows for place to actually kind of gauge what's going on inside of these areas, so they can survey these areas 
as they fill their lymph and get an idea for what's going on inside the bloodstream. Like, what's happening? What's going on inside the body? Because that fluid is getting filtered through, and they can figure out anything that doesn't belong. It's like, ooh, something suspicious is happening. All right, let's let's get activated. You know, there's a random pathogen popping through. Remember, that can be travel through this lymphatic system. Uh, and cancer cells, right? Those can all get picked up, hopefully destroyed. Maybe not, but at least you maybe provoke some sort of immune response. Because these cells have to wait there uh, to get activated for the first time at this point. So that's a big part of it. Uh, a lot of this has reticular connective tissue. Man, we talked about this way back when now. Uh, it's that cool uh, purple, black, webby looking tissue. So it, within there are macrophages to go through and destroy and rip up some pieces uh, of what doesn't belong. You know, all that stuff has to, has to get out of there. You know, I gotta get out of town. That uh, there's a couple main types of lymphoid tissue. You have diffuse lymphoid tissue, which is a uh, overall just kind of a looser arrangement of all these cells and the fibers. And so this is found in, in a lot of the organs. A lot of the organs are. Uh, and there's larger collections of this uh, in mucous membranes. And so this diffuse type tissue, uh, you can see, and so you can actually see it in the picture where it's labeled a diffuse lymphoid tissue. So it's got that classic color to it. Uh, where that's found. So, boom. That's where you uh, the follicles, the nodules, they're solid, larger bodies uh, that has tightly packed cells of those fibers. And inside they have spots where B cells can proliferate, which, you know, divide and become activated. And so they can get bigger when B cells are dividing rapidly and making plasma cells, which will lead to the production of antibodies. And so you can actually find some of these in the intestines in things called Peyer's patches, which we'll see in lab when we get to that week. And you also find in the appendix. So if you're wondering what the appendix does, well, it plays a role in the immune response. Uh, it houses some of these types of cells in this area to help attack things. So maybe inside the intestines, they don't need to be there. Uh, and so these lymphoid follicles, nodules, can become part of larger lymph nodes, which is the, probably the structure you're most common with when it comes to lymphatic system or lymph nodes. Uh, so lymphoid organs, um, so that's our tissue we just talked about, right? And so now we're looking at the lymphoid organs. So there's two types you're going to have. You have primary or secondary. Uh, primary is where they mature. It's always something about like primary school. Right, you go there and you know, you have that inertial age of maturing, I guess, in some way. Um, so you age up, you know, high school, reach up the old 18 points, so we have a lot of maturing to do, but I mean, you know, hey, you mature to a degree, you're now an adult, so officially, you know, mature in that way. Um, and so this is where they go. And so the primary lymphoid organs, red bone marrow and thymus, we've talked about this, this is all familiar, we've discussed these things before, where T and B cells mature. Uh, T cells mature in the thymus, uh, B cells in the red bone marrow. Uh, meanwhile, the T and B cells both come from bone marrow. They just mature in different spots. Then we have the secondary organs. Now, this is where it's a little different because these are ones where they go and hang out before they get activated. And again, we, I think we mentioned this before the T and B cell life cycles is they would go to these spots to wait to encounter and become activated that first time. Uh, so it's waiting to encounter the bad thing and go on and fight it and hopefully win. Uh, so lymph nodes, common spot for that. Um, the mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue is found, uh, so that forms like tonsils and the pyrus patches, the small tendons, uh, intestine, and then the appendix as well. So it's just kind of various lymphatic tissue found in different parts of the body. Uh, and the spleen, too, plays a role with this. And so if you saw uh, Infinity War, Avengers Infinity War, you know, right? So there's, you had the mature heroes, so they're going out there trying to fight uh, Thanos for the first time. So they're waiting for him on the island, and then he comes by, and they become activated. It's go time. And they fight, and they lose, kind of. Uh, but they lose that fight, win the war. Uh, but, yeah, anyway. Uh, so here's a diagram showing you some of these organs. So it gives you an example of primary lymphoid organs and then secondary lymphoid organs. You should be pretty familiar with this diagram, uh, at least for lab, for sure. Okay, lymph nodes. So there, lymph nodes are one of the big things you think about when they the lymphatic system, right? That's what I always think about. Like, oh, my lymph nodes are swollen. Oop, you know, better go to the doctor. Uh, the lymph nodes are acting up again. Um, there's a lot of these throughout the body, though, a lot of them. Uh, hundreds of these found scattered through, and these are places where they go through and help filter lymph to see what's going on. 
Uh, this is the main organ of that secondary lymphoid patch. Spleen, you know, kind of one spot. Malt is kind of in, you know, in specific locations. Lymph nodes, though, kind of all over the body. Uh, and they're usually kind of embedded in connective tissue, but sometimes you can have some that are kind of uh, near the surface, so you can actually kind of feel them uh, in those spots. And so you can find those uh, in the in the inguinal area, the armpit area, the neck region. I actually have one on my back of my neck that I was was worried about for years, but uh, I remember getting checked out by my doctor, and he's like, "Yeah, it's just a lymph node. It's just near the surface." So it's just it feels like a weird bump, though. I was always paranoid about it for years, but you know. Luckily, I'm going to be now, but I don't know. It's never gotten bigger, so that's a good thing. Uh, I never know the feel mine in my throat. Like, I don't know if I chin that well. Like, people can not just feel them all the time. Not really me. I feel stuff in there, but not those. I did have these random cysts once uh, in my jaw. So there's, like, random, like, little balls that are formed up. And you can, I can actually roll it up and down my jaw on my right side for... That was back when I was, like, a senior in high school. I had that thing. And so I'd get bored in class and just play with it. Uh, move it around. Every now and then, I can feel kind of something like that, but I hope it's not there anymore. Uh, yeah, my doctor said he had one in his knee he played with all the time. Uh, so I'm going to feel better about it. But it was just weird, though, because you feel like a random thing you can move in there. That was like a bone chip or something, or a tooth that got loose, or I don't know, something weird. Uh, but no, it's just a random cyst you can play with. Uh, it's kind of fun. Uh, anyway. Uh, Here's again that same diagram showing those lymph nodes. Uh, you should know it where some of those things are found. So this is an example of specific nodes, so inguinal nodes where those are spotted, axillary. You know, be able to spot those where they're Okay, what's the lymph node doing for you? All right, what's the point? Uh, well, lymph filters. They filter out lymph. And so you have macrophages that go through and destroy things that they can, whatever that may be, and get rid of it. And also any debris that comes in from maybe damage of some sort. And then what you, the goal here is to try and destroy anything for before you deliver it back to blood. So it's already been coming in, maybe it's directly from a site you know, of an injury, and it's just coming through this way, being drained by those lymphatic vessels. You don't want to get in the bloodstream, that's your main objective. If it's in the bloodstream, it can get anywhere. So they want to destroy it here, prevent it from going further. Uh, and then also, you activate the immune system. So in this spot, you try and destroy what you can, but then you also tell the higher ups, like, hey, we got a problem here. Uh, so lymphocytes can go in, activate, get the adaptive immune system rolling. It takes a little bit to get going, right? But you can actually get that attack going as the macrophages do their thing, and at least get that response going. And that's one of the advantages of anti-presenting cells is, is it actually brings those attacks to this spot before the pathogen or antigen itself directly gets in there. So maybe cut it off a little bit ahead of time. A little preventative measure to prevent a more serious attack later on. Kind of like the self-quarantining and all that stuff we're doing now to prevent things from getting more serious down the line. So preventative measures. Um, it's crazy. Uh, whale shark, shown here on the top right, is a filter feeder. So it filters around. And it's actually a shark, uh, but it doesn't really eat people because it doesn't do that. It just filters through and eats small things. So it's more of like a more classic whale type appearance to it, uh, which is kind of cool uh, and very different. So, um, so yeah, got some options there. Uh, and so, okay, that's what they do about the immune system. Get that sucker going. I like good way. All right, so we talked about lymph nodes, what they do. Well, let's talk about how more about their structure. So they can vary in size, some small, some a little larger, overall more bean shaped. So they're not that super big. That's why I feel like an enlarged node. It's like, okay, what's going on there? And if it's enlarged, it indicates like maybe those cells are doing something inside of there. So they're mounting some sort of response, something's growing in there. Like it means like those cells have been activated and dividing. Uh, and that can be, you know, signs of trouble. Uh, so you can usually kind of tell, like, okay, your lymph nodes are small, maybe you're fighting off an infection or something, even though you're showing, you know, no symptoms. Uh, but uh, lymph nodes themselves have a castle to them, like most structures we talk about. Uh, there's tubuculi in there that help divide the nodes into compartments. You'll see a, a picture of these when you look for them in, on slides and lab uh, online. So that's a, that's a way we'll do with like slides. But yeah, you'll see some of these then. Go ahead, you get to see them in person. It's kind of cool, but it divides them up in the different sections that can do different functions. Uh, there's some regions of the node. Uh, and so we have the cortex, which is the outermost layer there. Uh, and this is where B cells will hang out and some T cells will be there as well. And 
dendritic cells, which remember again, APC trying to activate BNT cells. The medulla is also there, and it just has the lymphocytes and the macrophages. So it's important to note, like, you get within a lymph node, you have different sections that have different structures in them. Cortex has BNT cells, medulla has, uh, well, BNT cells as well, as well as macrophages. So, you know, we want to keep up with some of those uh, and what they're doing. You know, keep them straight and don't get confused, as best as you can. Lymphatic system's hard. This is not one of my favorite ones out there. I won't lie. It's kind of a tough one, too, to begin with our first on. Luckily, we also have part, part one of the respiratory, too, so it's not all lymphatic, uh, but it's there. Uh, here you can see the uh, lumps labeled. This is a good one for lab, so you can actually see a lot of the structure of the valve, the trabeculi, the overall capsule, outer layer, medulla, cortex, germinal center where the B cells hang out. Uh, so some, some big Here's one actually in person, so an actual picture lab, or a picture of an actual tissue via microscope. See the same structure. Uh, so swollen nodes, right? You got some swollen nodes. What's going on? And so these are usually happening when like you're trying to destroy something, but you get overwhelmed. So a lot of stuff's happening. So you have tons of cells dividing, getting going, and you're just getting overwhelmed by what's happening. So they swell up. Uh, so they come down to refer like swollen glands, and the glands are all swollen up. Uh, but that was said by uh, Frank on It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. It's a good show. Um, but you, sometimes it can be filled with pus. And so if you have like an infection going on, maybe something's filling up inside of there. And that's that's not desirable, right? You don't want that. Uh, and that's pretty gross. But bubose is what they call it when you have an inflamed swollen lymph nodes. And the bubonic plague was actually named based off of this. Because having those um, bubos, those you know, inflamed lymph nodes, was one of the main uh, features of the bubonic plague. So that's where it came from. And that was actually caused by not rats specifically, but fleas on rats. And they would spread it. You can actually still get the plague. You can actually get it out west in the United States. It's there, but it's just we have much better treatments for it now. So it's not as severe you know, as it once was way back when. I mean, it'll still kill you. Uh, but I mean, you know, bad milk can still kill you, or at least make you really sick. You know, we just have treatments for. Um, so lymph nodes can also be cancer sites if these spreading cancer cells get trapped there. And so they're usually swollen but not painful. And that's usually kind of a cause for concern if you have a swollen lymph node that's not painful if you touch it. Uh, that's like what I was worried about with my neck, right? The little lymph node I had, it felt, I don't know if it was big or not, I just felt it. Um, so this is how you can usually tell. Uh, if you have some sort of cancerous condition versus just a regular kind of infection condition. Uh, so this is why they may feel those to see if they hurt or not. Uh, speaking of dangerous in nodes, this is a African, giant African pouch rat. This thing is huge. Uh, it's threatened to be possible invasive uh, in different parts, maybe even Florida and the Keys. Uh, there can, there's definitely concern that may happen and it might get spread. And that would be a big problem because that's a big swolled up rat right but it don't necessarily i mean it's not painful just looking at it rather than you get a fear but it will cause some devastation once it spreads much like cancer does uh so you don't want that to necessarily take note so you don't want that thing getting spread here do you okay so to recap uh we have our structures so we have the primary lymphoid organs and secondary lymphoid organs what do we got uh, so with primary lymphoid organs, remember, think about which ones we got. Primary is where they mature, or where they're, uh, yeah, where they mature. So that is the, where the T and B cells mature. So hopefully you remember, they both originate in red bone marrow. B stays in state and, you know, goes red bone marrow. T cells go out of state, go to the thymus. Uh, secondary is where those mature lymphocytes are just hanging out, waiting to encounter their antigen, right, and become activated. And so nodes are the major one. We can also have the spleen and mucus associated lymphoid tissue, AKA malt. Uh, and then you also have the lymph filter, which is the thing that filters out the lymph. Now think about it, what structure might be best fit that talks to the description would be the lymph node. So boom, done, lymph node. Lymph transport organ, we transport lymph. Well, it's the lymphatic vessels that transports lymph, right? That's not too hard. Uh, and then ducts, right? We talked about those with the vessels. How many are there, right? How many ducts are there? Uh, you got two ducts, those ducts. What do they serve? All right, you have the thoracic duct and the right lymphatic duct. The right one does the upper right arm, right side of the head. That's it. Uh, and the thoracic does, well, the rest of the stuff. So right upper arm, right thoracic region, right head, uh, 
for the right lymphatic and then the rest. All right, so we're moving right along here. We should be able to finish this up pretty soon. So the spleen, let's talk about the spleen, what this thing does. Demol spleen. Uh, a lot of blood there. So this is also where blood vessels, or old blood cells go to die. They get trapped. But it also has some lymphatic stuff. And it turns out the spleen is actually the largest lymphoid organ out there, which is kind of weird. It's like, okay, that's you. That's your job. All right. Uh, it has its own artery and vein that brings it to it. And that uh, brings, enters, and exits at a structure called the hilum. Uh, it's pretty common. Uh, we see that. I think we'll see some of that pop up in another organ too. Um, but the function of the spleen is this is where lymphocytes can take part in the immune response, much like a lymph node. Well, they can be activated and divide into the thing, so during proliferation. And they also wait around. So memory cells, right, can be hanging out in these spots too. It's like, okay, we're looking for some trouble. What are we looking for? Uh, what, what's happening here? Um, so we can do that. So we have those options. Um, that's what it does. And it also gets rid of old blood cells we talked about. So all those old, like, random blood pieces. So any sort of debris is in there, old blood cells, like, it's broken down in the spleen, too. And it helps with lymphocytes, TMB cells, hanging out. <clears throat> all right, there's our structures again, the spleen. Now, this is what it looks like. It looks like a baked potato, or a sweet potato, rather. I'm not a big sweet potato fan, personally. I'm more of a, a regular old potato, uh, like a russet, something like that. Sounds good. I've had a lot of potatoes recently. I love me a good baked potato. Oh, man, it's delicious. I usually dip mine in ketchup, because uh, I'm crazy. And that's what I like to do, but it's delicious. Uh, and then here we have our spleen. See it again. Uh, it's kind of gross here. That's disgusting. Uh, that's nice and zoomed in. You can see the kidney hanging out back there, the artery. Man, that's um, okay. More functions of the spleen. Uh, it's storage. So, uh, any sort of things that are left over after blood's been broken down, it keeps it there. So it can be reused later on. Uh, so it's kind of like a USB flash drive in a way. Uh, you know, maybe. Uh, it stores things for release when needed, much like a good flash drive does. It keeps things ready to go until you need to use it, and then, you know, you hook it up and do that thing. Uh, and also maybe where red blood cells are made in the fetus. So in that early stage of development, you know, kidneys obviously play a role and bone plays a role. But maybe also the spleen can be a significant role at that point too. Uh, and so the spleen is covered by a capsule as well. And it also has trabeculi. So much like lymph nodes, it has some similar type of structures to it. Uh, and it has two parts. While the, the uh, other thing had cortex and medulla, this thing has a white pulp and a red pulp. So the white pulp is the part that actually does the immune function, while the red pulp is a site of breaking down red blood cells and destroying pathogens. So you got a couple different options here, uh, compartmentalized for a couple different functions. Uh, so let's look at some of these things. Uh, so here's the spleen. And so you're actually going to look at these on slides and try and find red pulp from white pulp. Uh, on the online slides, so yeah, you still get some slide experience. You can see the white pulp, but that's categorized, and you can see the red pulp uh, below it. They're pretty similar, but oh yeah, uh, different. So you like islands of white pulp scattered around red pulp. Uh, the spleen itself, the capsule's pretty pretty thin, so like any sort of injury or infection may cause it to rupture. Which is not great, because uh, that can lead to some health problems, you know, if you have blood going into your cavity. You can actually remove the spleen uh, if it's been ruptured in some way, so that can be done. Uh, one of the this was actually once more standard of a treatment, uh, but not as much anymore. Uh, and so, so, um, but now they've kind of discovered that it can repair itself, so they try and not necessarily remove it if at all possible. Uh, and if it is removed, uh, well, liver, bone marrow kind of take over most of its functions. Uh, if you leave a small part of it left and the kid is uh, 12 or younger, it'll actually regenerate and grow back. Um, but just good, I guess. Just like with tonsils, too. Um, speaking of tonsils, malt. So mucus-associated lymphoid tissue. Good old malt. This is where you have pockets of lymphoid-related tissue in other spots, so in mucous membranes. Remember, mucous membranes are the linings inside of our, our, our GI tract, so throughout the body. And so these can be found in the respiratory system, uh, the, the genital urinary uh, organs, because that's another area too. Uh, the mucous membranes, any sort of lining inside the body, so like lining like the urethra or something. Uh, digestive tract too, is all found there. And their main job is to try and protect you from things trying to get inside the body. 
as we know in this modern era, there's, you know, things always trying to, you know, take advantage and get in us and grow. And so bacteria, fungus, um, parasites, uh, anything, viruses, like all that sort of stuff. So you need these sorts of things to help prevent that. And they do their job as best as they can. Um, but sometimes they get overexposed or just can't beat them. Uh, but tonsils are one of those. You can see them there. And you see an inflamed versus normal tonsil. Pyrus patch, you know, the intestines. And, of course, the appendix. Uh, so let's look at some of these tonsils. All right, let's check these puppies out and what's going on. Okay, so the tonsils are overall pretty simple. There's not, you know, they're, they're not that complicated. When you look at the slide, though, it's pretty cool for what they look like. Um, but there are some that are uh, overall, you know, not too too, too complicated. Uh, so they can form uh, tissue around the pharynx. Uh, and so they look like kind of swelled areas of that tissue, but they're actually not. It's just the actual structure. I never really wanted to look and find my tonsils. I never had my tonsils taken out either. Uh, but that was always a thing I remember hearing about as a kid. Uh, but they're named according to where they're found. And so if you have a palatine tonsil, it's near the back end of the throat. So these are the ones that are most commonly infected. So if you've seen swollen tonsils in your mouth, that's probably the ones you saw. Uh, and there's also some that are, uh, you know, there's some at the back of the tongue. So you can see these too. So lingual tonsils, lingual associated with the tongue. Uh, but they're named according to their spot. Uh, so there's also pharyngeal tonsils. It's also called the adenoids. Located in the back of the nasal pharynx, so you probably haven't seen those. Uh, and there's also tubal tonsils, which are near the auditory tubes uh, into the pharynx, so you get a couple spots. And so, functions of tonsils what do they think those things do? Uh, so, they help, you know, filter out pathogens that are coming in and bring stuff in. Um, so, you take a risk of trying to bring stuff in, like you bring bacteria and you bring pathogens in inside of this spot and that's kind of risky uh, because you why you want to just trap it and destroy it it may not work because you're actually directly bringing it into tissues where before maybe it was maybe it would have been destroyed by the stomach or something like it would have been fine but now like you're you're, you're in there you know you're in it uh, so you, you're in there battling it with what you got um, but the pro is uh, it does allow immune cells to become activated and build memory against it so you can get that response going can do some destruction uh, it just depends, you know, little, could be great, could be bad, much like an Aladdin, right, when he gets lured into that little cave of wonder thing, you know, and then the monkey thing tries to steal some jewels and the whole thing falls apart, and then he nearly escapes, but you know, he can escape by using a genie wish, so he could have used that wish for something else, but instead, you know, he couldn't, um, I don't know, I don't know what I would, I don't know, what would you wish for, leave it in the comments, uh, if you had a genie three wishes, I don't know what I'd wish for, but something cool. I don't know. Powers, maybe? Be able to fly? Maybe have a super immune system? I don't know. It's kind of lame. Eh, at the same time, it'd suck to be able to fly. Then, like, oh, well, the flu got you. You know, that would suck. Uh, but in this picture in the bottom left, <laughs> speaking of crypts, you can actually see the tonsil are crypt and then the lymphatic stuff surrounding that. So, actually, you know, bring it in, get it inside, and try and fight that sucker off and win. Uh, well, otherwise, infection. Man. Okay, so there we go. You can see the germinal centers surrounding the crypts. So, waiting to respond to the pyrus patches. These are found inside of the small intestines. Uh, overall, kind of like tonsils are really, I mean, kind of have similar functions. Their main job is to destroy bacteria. And so, the intestines' main job is to absorb, you know, nutrients. And so, they're very permeable, right? And so, that can mean bacteria can get in you. Well, luckily you got these puppies, the way they're looking out for you. So they're like, oh, wait a minute. Hold up now. You're not getting in us. Uh, you're going to come on in, all right, then we're going to destroy you. And make some memory cells, so if we ever see your kind around here again, we're going to beat you up again. Prevent you from getting established inside of my body. Uh, so that's what they do. Pyrus patches. And so like little like little spots are just exploding power. Tear down bacteria. Kind of like the Death Star in a way. Uh, but here, you can see this in the small intestines, uh, you can actually see pyrus patches, those little, little blobs in there. Hopefully you can see these in the lab on the slides, I don't remember. How will those show up? Uh, appendix. Okay, we're nearing the end here of uh, the old appendix. And so, um, this is, uh, comes off when the large intestines breaks off, this is a part of that. 
So we had small intestines as the pyrus patches. This thing is kind of like the pyrus patch and that the, where it is it helps with it. So again, the same thing, trying to destroy bacteria, germinate membrane lymphocytes. It's kind of the exact same as the pyrus patch, just in a different spot. Uh, on the bottom left, you can see a picture of an inflamed appendix, what that looks like. And you know, you can live without it. Uh, speaking of appendicitis, so we have an infl inflammation of the appendix. Uh, my cousins nearly ruptured once, and I was, became well aware of the symptoms, which is throwing up, extreme nausea, and because you're throwing up constantly, you don't have much of a desire to eat, makes sense, uh, and extreme pain, which was him. He ended up in the hospital uh, right around Thanksgiving, which kind of ruined our big family Thanksgiving we were hoping to have, and big football game, but we never had that ever after that. So that was our one chance to pull it off, and he had to get a pen beside us. Oh, um, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, so, well, we didn't actually do it, but it's okay. Uh, he also got pneumonia while in the hospital, oh, because that happens in medical facilities. You were there, and you can actually get sick again. It's called nosocomial infections, people. Uh, wash your hands, stay clean, even when are in the hospital. Right? You're not immune to stuff. Some serious stuff can be found in the hospital make you real sick, so be careful. What I find unnerving is that a third of the people who do not have these symptoms at all, but they have appendicitis, which is terrifying, because it means at any point I could have appendicitis, and I don't even know it, and it's on the verge of rupturing and extreme pain. Uh, sounds terrible. Uh, and then somebody has to cut me up with a knife on the street and just rip it out, and it explodes, which is pretty terrifying. Uh, and then you can have some pretty severe infections and problems, uh, including sepsis, which is not great. Uh, if it bursts inside of your body, do you want something bursting inside of your body? I don't think so. Uh, I sure don't. So, man, messed up. Uh, there's a video, a companion video that goes along with this. Check it out. Uh, so, yeah. So, again, there's the appendix and virus patches we discussed. I'll talk about the tonsils. So, all the. Where those are found, keep up with locations and what they do. Oh, excuse me. All similar but um, different functions. Uh, so thymus, another structure. Again, uh, more often when it's in the young, goes away when you're older. We've talked about that, you know, ad nausea. Uh, that's one of those structures found near the thyroid. So when a lot of you're cutting up your thyroid and the pig, while well, that thing got eviscerated uh, and destroyed. Uh, as I soon discovered, I was filming videos of those pigs last earlier this week for a lab to show the thymus, and none of them were there anymore, or at least not recognizable. Uh, but this is mostly just a, ch a kid thing, so during childhood it goes away. It still has some cells to it, it's just a lot slower as it gradually dies. So the older you get, the less thymus you got. That's nice. Uh, and so the thymus, uh, it's broken into some spots that have a cortex and medulla. The cortex is where the rapidly dividing cells are found. More the medulla, it doesn't really have as many of the lymphocytes that are present, but they have some regulatory T cells there. And those play a role with autoimmunity, so that's probably what the thymus, you know, is kind of thinking that's more a little more for. Uh, and so it's just to make a big T cell site. That's kind of unique. We've talked about that before in this chapter, so that kind of stands out as something unique. For the um, and so the thymus uh, is different from the other lymphoid organs in a few ways. It doesn't have any follicles because uh, it has many B cells, so there's no germinal follicles there that are present. It does not directly fight antigens. Uh, it only helps mature T lymphocytes. Uh, and it keeps immature T lymphocytes from contacting any antigens to prevent them from being activated beforehand. So remember, they have to go those mature steps, right? Positive and negative selection. Well, it prevents them from you know, hitting those things too soon, possibly getting bad T cells out and about in the body. Uh, so even their main job, though, is just maturing T lymphocytes. Uh, they also have a stroma. And that is made up of epithelial tissue cells and not reticular fibers. So reticular tissue was the one we talked about the most earlier. That was found in these lymphoid tissues. But not here. The thymus is, is very different. Uh, it does not have those. So again, it just allows them to have an environment uh, where they can just, you know, go through and function in the immune system. Just a nice, safe place for T lymphocytes to grow. Uh, so keep babies, you know, doing their thing. I'll keep them, you know, nice, safe place. Like X Men, uh, Professor Gaber's Academy, right? So he actually used those in combat, but this is a little different. All right, there's the thymus. So you can actually see the corpuscles with regulatory T cells pop up, the medulla, the cortex, and the capsule. So I think that is it, folks. Uh, our first one done in the books. Yes. I uh, hope you all enjoyed it. I hope you all listened. Uh, had a good time with everything. 
uh, learn something about the lymphoid tissue. I'm sorry if my throat is a little dry today. Uh, I've done a lot of talking today at this point. Uh, so I think it's starting to go on me a little bit. So I might take a break and not film respiratory today. And actually film that tomorrow. Uh, so my voice will be a little fresher. Uh, so yeah, but that's been fun. We'll do this a few more times. We've got Restore coming up next. That's a great chapter. And then we have Digestive, Urinary, and Reproductive. So we don't have that much left. Uh, but yeah, it's different. But we'll make it work. We'll have some fun along the way. Don't forget your uh, post.